journey into the enigmatic world of the disciples of Horus, delve into the mysteries of Egypt's aristocracy, explore the influence of the Shemzu Or, and uncover the truth behind the Caucasoid elements in Egyptian culture. Join us as we unveil ancient secrets and shed light on the transcontinental origins of Egypt's rulers. Are you ready to embark on an extraordinary voyage through history? Unveiling Ancient Aristocracies, the Enigmatic Legacy of the Disciples of Horus. Professor Emery wrote of his finds in his book, Archaic Egypt, Culture and Civilization in Egypt 5,000 years ago. Towards the end of the 4th millennium BC, the people known as the Disciples of Horus appear as a highly dominant aristocracy that governed entire Egypt. The theory of the existence of this race is supported by the discovery in the pre-dynastic tombs, in the northern part of Higher Egypt, of the anatomical remains of individuals with bigger skulls and builds than the native population, with so much difference to exclude any hypothetical common racial strain. The fusion of the two races must have come about in ages that concurred more or less with the unification of the two Egyptian kingdoms. The racial origin of these invaders is not known, and the route they took in their penetration of Egypt is equally obscure. We find that at the dawn of the historic period, Egypt was divided into the two rival kingdoms of the north and the south, both ruled by a royal house and aristocracy of the same race, and both known traditionally as the followers of Horus, the demigods of Manetho's history. According to the ancient tablets, known as the History of Thoth, the Atlantean, the Shemzu Or, or Disciples of Horus, were a race of enlighteners who dwelt on ten pre-Dilovian islands. One of their magi was the god Thoth, known by the Greek as Hermes and by the Romans as Mercury. Great were my people in the ancient days, great beyond the conception of the little people now around me. Knowing the wisdom of old, seeking far within the heart of infinity knowledge that belonged to Earth's youth. Wise were we with the wisdom of the children of light who dwelt among us. Strong were we with the power drawn from the eternal fire. And all of these, greatest among the children of men was my father Thoth, keeper of the great temple, link between the children of light who dwelt within the temple and the races of men who inhabited the Ten Islands. Unveiling the Enigmatic Guardians of Egypt, Shemzu Or and the Legacy of Horites The term Shemzu derives most probably from the Akkadian Shamash, meaning serpent. The word is very like the Irish Shamus or Siamus or English James. We believe the term Hor for Horus, the falcon or hawk-headed god of the sun, represented the Ari or Aryans. The letter H was often used in the same way as the or as le in French. Therefore Har or Hari was the Ari. The eagle or hawk was the symbol of the sun and of the enlightened ones of old. As a symbol, it primarily and originally signified spiritual status. The name Harris or Harrison from Har meant hawk or son of the hawk. Expert on Egypt, Ralph Ellis has found evidence supporting the idea that the Giza Plateau and its three great pyramids were perpetually protected by a special guard known as the Horites. These Horites, although disparaged in the Bible, are believed to be associated with the mysterious city of Petra, located near Mount Ser. Petra dates from a relatively late period but probably built upon a more ancient site. Nearby are sophisticated irrigation systems and a strange serpent mound identical to those found in France and Britain. There can be little doubt that the Horites were descended from the ancient Shemzu Or, the disciples of Horus. As stated, the root Har or Hor refers to Horus and the sun. Ellis maintains that this mysterious sect of specially appointed guards was despised by the Hyksos people, who were none other than the Israelites of the Bible, see Volume 2. He also maintains that one of the ancient names for the Great Pyramid was Seir, a word that appears to connote the West, see Sarah, Assur, Aser, Osiris, Abu Sir, and Syria. If Mr. Ellis's translations are correct, as we believe them to be, then could not Mount Horeb of the Bible refer to the pyramids of the desert, rather than some other ill-defined and spuriously remote location? Was the pyramid the mountain of light, or more correctly, 
the Mountain of the Men of Light, unveiling ancient secrets, the mysterious Caucasians of Nubia and their enigmatic influence on Egyptian culture. In the year 1907, the Egyptian government decided to raise the level of the Great Aswan Dam in southern Egypt by 7 meters. The project meant the destruction by flooding of acres of land containing many burial grounds and tombs. A hurried examination of the bodies from some Nubian tombs was made by Sir Grafton Elliot Smith, who soon discovered, to his amazement, that the skulls and bones of the bodies under examination were different from those of the inhabitants of both Nubia and Egypt, even though there were Egyptian characteristics to the physiognomy. In his book The Royal Mummies, published in 1912, Smith wrote of his strange alien finds. The alien people presented many striking features of contrast which sharply differentiate them from the population of Egypt and Nubia. In height, they do not differ in any marked degree, but their crania are shorter and considerably broader than those of the indigenous people. The nose is much narrower, more prominent, and high-bridged than that of the Egyptian or Nubian, and in comparison with the latter, the nasal spine is much more prominent. Nobody knows just who these blue-eyed, fair-skinned people were, or even where they came from. Anthropologically, they were termed Caucasians, Gerald O'Farrell, the Tutankhamun deception. There are those who think that the decision to flood the sacred Nubian plains of the northern Sudan was a clever ploy to conceal the burial grounds of the western peoples who had influenced Egyptian culture. In ancient times, Nubia was an independent region considered sacred by the Egyptians who thought of it as the realm of the gods. The Nile flowed down through the mountains of Nubia, and so anyone buried in that area by request or by tradition was highly esteemed. The Caucasian features described by Sir Elliot Smith are to be seen on the face of Queen Nefertiti, her sister Munjamet, wife of Pharaoh Haramheb, and her daughter Meritatan, Skada. Indeed, there is little doubt in our minds that Nefertiti and her family were of Irish ancestry. This explains why Skada, her eldest daughter, traveled to Ireland by the way of Spain after the fall of Akhenaten's corrupt dynasty, and why her grave was found not in Egypt, but in Ireland's County Kerry. The 20th prayer of the 141st chapter of the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead is dedicated to the goddess greatly beloved with red hair, E.A.W. Budge, the Book of the Dead. The pre-dynastic Egyptians, that is to say, that stratum of them which was indigenous to North Africa, belonged to a white or light-skinned race with fair hair who in many particulars resembled the Libyans, who in later historical times lived very near the western bank of the Nile. E.A.W. Budge, Egypt in the Neolithic and Archaic Periods It is singular to find a white race spoken of in the ancient monuments. Dr. Brugsch, the learned German, notices the word Tumhu or white men, as it occurs on tablets dated 2,500 years before Christ. It is puzzling to indicate the people. Brugsch traces them to Libya. Champollion recognized the Tumhu as a type of European ancestry. M. Deveria remarks upon hieroglyphs recording the fact that Horus, the god, led and guided a white race. As there are still many Celtic monuments in the north of Africa, over many hundreds of miles, he contends for the existence of an original Celtic people in Egypt, or in modern language, that the Welsh and Irish were once in Egypt. James Bonwick, Egyptian Belief and Modern Thought, 1878 Unveiling ancient secrets, intriguing insights into Egyptian royalty and transcontinental origins. Among the ancient crania from the Thebaic in the collection in the Department of Human Anatomy at Oxford, there are specimens which must unhesitatingly be considered to be those of Nordic type. L. H. Dudley Buxton, The Peoples of Asia. Ancient Egypt, for instance, was essentially a penetration of Caucasoid racial elements into Africa. Robert Gare, Miscellaneous Racial Studies. The mummy was mostly unwrapped and on its back. Stands of reddish blonde hair lay on the floor beneath the bald head. Donald P. Ryan, Description of Find, by Excavator of the Tomb of Queen Hatshepsut. There was a queen, Nitocris, braver than all the men of her time, the most beautiful of all the women, blonde-haired with rosy cheeks. 
By her, it is said the third pyramid was reared, with the aspect of a mountain. Manetho, 3rd century Greco-Egyptian historian's description of 6th dynasty queen Nitocris. According to the Greco-Roman authors Pliny the Elder, Strabo, and Diodorus Siculus, the third pyramid was built by a woman named Rhodopis. When translated from the original Greek, her name means rosy-cheeked, Mary Sutherland. The first pharaoh of the first dynasty of Egypt and founder of the great city of Memphis, King Menes is buried in Northern Ireland, also known as Ahamen, and as Hor Aha, Fighting Hawk, King Menes was most likely a prestigious member of Egypt's first civilization, the remnants of which were discovered by Professor Walter Emery and founded by the disciples of Horus, the sun god. In one ancient text, from his empty tomb discovered by Sir Flinders Petrie at Abydos in 1900, Menes is referred to as King Manash, or the Sunhawk race. It is not surprising, therefore, that he should have wished to travel to Ireland, the original homeland of his ancestors. Most pathetically tragic of all, perhaps, is the discovery that the hitherto unread long record inscribed on the great ebony label found in the tomb of Menes at Abydos in Upper Egypt, and written in the Sumerian script and language of his time, narrates in graphic and circumstantial detail how this great admiral and world emperor, in his old age, on a voyage of exploration with his fleet, made the complete course to the furthest west sunset land land in the western ocean, and there met his tragic death, and it states that his tomb in Egypt remained empty and was merely a cenotaph. And the place name of the island in the far western ocean which appears to read Urani suggests the place of his death and real tomb as Erin or Ireland. L. A. Waddell, Makers of Civilization in Race and History, 1929. The intertwining history, anthropology, and mythology sheds light on the enigmatic origins of ancient Egypt's rulers. From the dominance of the disciples of Horus to the influence of the Shemsu Hor, each revelation peels back layers of mystery surrounding Egypt's aristocracy. As we delve into the transcontinental origins and Caucasoid elements of Egyptian culture, we're left questioning the true legacy of these ancient civilizations. But the journey doesn't end here. Stay tuned for the next installment where we'll delve deeper into untold secrets.